In this training session, we're going to review reporting protocols and steps to report monthly CDI surveillance. Before we get into the reporting steps, we will review the protocols to help you identify which CDI Lab ID events to report and which ones not to report. Do not report lab results into NHSN that were collected prior to the resident's admission to the nursing home. You are to only enter CDI Lab ID events that were tested while the resident was in the facility. We suggest keeping a log of positive CDI lab results to keep track of duplicate test results to avoid reporting those that are considered duplicates. We will talk more about duplicate lab ID results in just a minute. All identified CDI lab ID events must be entered into NHSN using the specific location where the resident was assigned at the time of specimen collection. It allows facilities to keep track of where the infections are occurring in the facility as well as monitor trends in individual units and facility-wide. Here are some reminders you may have already seen regarding reporting. There are three steps to CDI surveillance reporting. Monthly reporting plan, summary data report, and event reporting if there are any events to report. We will go over these when we get to each of these steps. Monthly reporting is due by the 15th day of each month for the previous month's data. A reminder will be sent out prior to the due date each month, so about a week before. Those who do not report by the 15th of each month will receive a follow-up reminder. We highly encourage each facility to have a backup user that is authorized to enter data into the NHSN facility group in case the NHSN facility administrator is unable to enter the monthly data due to reasons such as on leave, change of responsibility, or turnover. The backup person only needs to complete the SAMS registration process since the facility has already been enrolled. The recommendation is to designate someone from medical records, a resident care manager, or your designated infection prevention staff. This page covers stole sample. Um, it covers the stole sample collection and reviews what tests labs may use to determine whether the sample shows positive CDI. Only loose stool should conform to the container and only loose stool samples should be tested and reported. The most important identifiers to report are those that, I, that have a positive toxin result. Here's a table to hopefully help with visualization. CD vesicle infection is identified when the resident has a positive lab test for toxin A and or toxin B. It can also be identified if there's a toxin producing C. difficile organism detected by a stool culture. Do not report in NHSN if a lab report shows a positive antigen but a negative toxin. I have mentioned earlier that duplicate lab ID events are not to be reported in NHSN. A duplicate is a C. difficile positive test from the same resident following a previous C. difficile positive test within the past 14 days while a resident is in the facility. If the CDI lab ID test was conducted longer than 14 days since the last test, the CDI lab ID event uh, that comes back positive can be reported. Let's review the case example for one patient in a facility. As you see here, the first date, which is 1-3-2016, is the initial test that was conducted, came back positive. This is not a duplicate because it is the initial test. So this can be reported into NHSN. The second test that was done for this resident, you see it was on 1-9. Because that was within two weeks from the previous test, it is considered a duplicate. So it is not reported. The 120 2016 test that was done is considered a duplicate because it has been less than 14 days since the 19 2016 test that was conducted. So this will not be reported. So when you are when we're talking about 14 days, we're not talking about 14 days from only the initial test. We're talking about from the most recent test that was conducted. Even if that test was considered a duplicate, that still counts as a test that was conducted. So that's why the 120 is considered a duplicate because it's within 14 days from the 19 test. The, one, the next one is 129. 
that is within two weeks from the 120 test, even though that came back positive, that's still a duplicate, so it's not reported. The last one you see is 223. It's been more than 14 days from the 129 test, so that is not considered a duplicate, so it can be reported into NHSN. Be careful to not enter in any duplicates into NHSN, as NHSN will not know if a lab test is a duplicate if the date appears to be more than 14 days from a resident since the last report entered into NHSN, even though in reality, there was a lab test that was conducted within 14 days. For example, the 1-9-2016 lab test that was not inputted into NHSN, but then if they put in the 1-20-2016, it will appear to not be a duplicate in NHSN, but it really is a duplicate because the 1-9-2016, even though it wasn't reported, it was still ran. The system will only recognize the 1-3-2016 event and 1-20. Once you have determined that the positive CDI lab ID event is not a duplicate, the next step is to determine if it is an incident or recurrent. So incident and recurrent both can be reported. The only one that's not reported is the duplicate. An incident CDI lab ID event is any CDI lab ID event from a specimen collected greater than eight weeks after the most recent CDI lab ID event entered into NHSN or the first lab ID event ever entered for the resident while in the facility. A recurrent CDI lab ID event is any lab ID event entered more than two weeks, but less than eight weeks after the most recent lab ID event reported for an individual resident in the, faci in, in the facility. So it would be for you look for a duplicate if it's been within two weeks. If it has been within two weeks, you do not report. If it's been more than two weeks, then you determine is this a recurrent or an incident. So if it's been more than two weeks but less than eight weeks, it's a recurrent. If it's been more than eight weeks since the last test that was conducted, or if it's the initial test where there was never one that was conducted prior to that one, then that will be considered an incident. So on the right side is an org chart to help you better understand duplicate, incident, and recurrent. Here's an example of how incident versus recurrent would apply to each case for one resident. So as you see in the left side where it says resident, resident ID, this is the same resident. The current admit date does change in this table, and I will go over that in just a minute. And the third, which is the middle column, which is the CDI event date, which is the date of the specimen collection. So the first one that was collected on 3-6-2015 came back positive, so it's considered an incident because it's the initial test that was conducted for this resident while in the facility, or it's been more than eight weeks since the last test that was conducted. The second that one that was conducted for the same admission time frame, 3-1, it was, the specimen was collected on 4-8. It has been more than two weeks, however, it's been less than eight weeks, so it's a recurrent, so it's still reported, but it's gonna be identified as a recurrent. The third one has a new mission date. So the resident left um, and then they came back after the time frame to allow a bull to keep it within the same admission period, so two or three days. And so when they came back, they had another test that was conducted on 514. However, just because the admission date changes, it doesn't change the fact that the last test that was conducted on this resident was on 48. So the mission date doesn't affect whether it's an incident or recurrent. What affects it is still the specimen collection date. So in this case, it's, it's been more than two weeks since the 4-H test that was conducted, but it has been less than eight weeks. So this is also a recurrent. The following one that you see, which was on 8-10, it has been more than eight weeks since the 514 specimen, which was the last one that was collected. And so therefore it's an incident. And same goes for the last one, which is on 11-21. It's been more than eight weeks since the last test that was conducted, which was 8-10. That is also considered an incident. So now you've entered the event. 
Based on the date of current admission to the facility and date of specimen collection, the NHSN application will further categorize each reported event to determine if the event is a community onset lab ID event, also known as CO or CO lab ID event, or a long-term care facility onset lab ID event, also known as a low or LO lab ID event. If determined a lab ID event, the application will look to see if this event was documented as coming from an acute care transfer long-term care facility onset lab ID event, also known as ACT low. ACT low is determined if the specimen collection date is equal to or less than four weeks following date of last transfer from an acute care facility, such as a hospital, long-term care acute hospital, or acute inpatient rehab stay. So this question, it will be asked in the event report when you're doing your data entry um, and reporting your event. There's a question that we will go over in, um, later on when we're going over how to report an event that will ask you if this resident was transferred from an acute care transfer long-term care facility on set within the last four weeks. That's how it will be able to identify that. Here you'll see a table that shows how the NHSN application will determine whether the event is community onset or long-term care facility onset. And I will repeat that it is up to the NHSN application that will determine this. You as the user will not have to determine this. It's, and it goes based on the criteria that you enter in. So in, as an example, day one is the day that the resident's been admitted to your facility. So if you do conduct a CDI lab ID test within the first three days of their admission, to your facility and it comes back positive, that will be considered a community onset lab ID event. If it's been the fourth day or past four day, the fourth day since they've been admitted to your facility and it comes back positive, that will be considered a long-term care facility onset. So now we're going to review reporting. The first thing you need to do when it comes to reporting is you're going to need to log into the NHSN application. To do so, you will type in https colon forward slash forward slash sams.cdc.gov. When you type that in, it will take you to the home page here, the login page I should say, which is, and you're going to log into the portal, there's going to be three portals, you'll log into the middle portal which shows the grid card, SAMS grid card credentials, select login. It will take you to the first login page, which is logging in with your email that you set up when you created your SAMS account, as well as the password that you created when you set up your SAMS account. Once you have successfully passed that, it will take you to the SAMS grid card credentials login page where you will log in with your grid card credential criteria. It will include a letter and a number. The letter is the column, the number is the row. This changes at each login, so it will never be the same for each login. So once you have successfully passed that, you will be directed to the My Applications page. Here, you're going to select NHSN Reporting. So the next page determines on whether you're reporting for one or multiple facilities. If you're only reporting for one facility, you will be directed straight to the home page. If you're reporting for more than one facility, it will take you to the NHSN landing page where you will be able to select the facility that you are reporting for from the drop down, and then it will take you, well actually you have to select long-term care facility as well for the component part. That will always be the option to select, then select submit. Then it will take you to the home page. So under the home page, to create a monthly reporting plan, that's the first thing you have to report is the monthly reporting plan. So you cannot go further until you've created the monthly reporting plan for that month. So to do that, Go to Reporting Plan, Add, and once you select Add, it will take you to the monthly reporting page. So you're going to select the month and the year, and below that, you will go down to Lab ID Event Module, where you will fill this out. You're going to, if you see the HAI Module or Prevention Process Measure Module, you can skip those because those do not apply to this project. Only fill out the information for the Lab ID Event Module. And what you're going to input here, it's going to be standard at all times. So it's also listed here. You're going to select under locations, back wide in, dash, back wide in patient. Under specific organism types, select C. dip, C. difficile. And you're going to check this box. Checking the box confirms that all specimens will be checked. 
Once you've done that, select Save, and you're done with your monthly reporting plan for that month. You will get a confirmation that says Plan Saved Successfully. So there is also an option to copy the monthly reporting plan. You can copy up to 12 months worth of reporting plans. Some people like to do this because it saves them time um, in the future. So let's say you have five to 10 minutes to spare and you wanna save yourself some time in the future, you can go ahead and create um, any monthly reporting plans starting from you know, March to February of 2018. So in this case, what you will do is instead of going to add, you will select find. And then you're gonna select the month and year that you want to copy and hit find. It will pull it up here. And there's a little button here that says copy from previous month. So when you select that button, the system will know that you want to copy the next month. And then you select save. Once you've done that, you have created a copy for the next month. And you can repeat this process in order to create up to 12 months worth of reporting plans. The other option, if you don't want to do that way, it's a little longer, but you can do this as select add and just keep following the add process that we just reviewed with adding and then filling out this information here and saving. You could do that as well. It's either way it works for copying a monthly reporting plan or creating new monthly reporting plans. There is a situation that I do want to mention. It's very rare, um, but it may happen. So just wanted to bring this up. There may be a time if your facility is not reporting or providing surveillance for a month. And so instead of not reporting anything, you still have to indicate some things to let the NCC and NHSN as well as us know that uh, purposely there's no data entered in. So to do that, what you have to do is still complete a monthly reporting plan by going to add and you select the month and year or um, you can do find as well if you want to kind of make it something you're going to copy. But instead of filling out this information on the lab ID event module, you're going to fill out this checkbox here. It says no long-term care facility component modules followed this month. You will select this. Again, this only applies if your facility is not providing CDI surveillance for a certain month. And that way, the system will not alert you to fill out other areas. This will also let those of us who are reviewing the data know that you are not providing, there's no data that's going to be recorded because there was no surveillance conducted. So we won't bother you to, or send you reminders to add in data. This is an example of, a, we have an electronic copy of this. We suggest using this unless you have another way to track um, CDI Lab ID events. The reason why we suggest using this form is because the questions that are inputted in here reflect what's in the electronic um, event reporting form. So that way, if you fill this out, and you're going to report the event, you have everything right in front of you, so you don't have to go back and forth looking because you can't save the event report data until you've completed it all. You can't stop in the middle and save and then go back to it. So we're gonna go over reporting an event, if there is an event to report. If you do not have an event to report for a certain month, you will skip this step, but if you do, then you will follow these steps. So you're gonna to go to event, add and then you'll see the page here says add event pop up and so the facility id is defaulted it will automatically show up the resident id will need to be created by you the user when you're adding the event usually facilities use the medical record number because it's just easier to track down the line if you want to pull a report for all the events you reported for a specific resident you can and you use the same resident id number because you remember it because the medical record number um, you just type it in in the in the filter section and it will pop up all the events that you've reported for a resident. You can also do that many other options too, not just resident ID. You can do that by name, um, event date. Um, there are a few other options as well. But um, that's why people use the medical record number. It's just easy to remember. Everything with a red asterisk is required to be entered in. Anything that does not have a red asterisk is optional, but some facilities like to enter in information anyways just to narrow it down in case they are looking for a specific event or a specific group of events for a resident, it will help them narrow down that that's the correct resident. This is another snapshot of the electronic reporting form. 
and it's just uh, the bottom of the reporting form. So while you're reporting in these, this information here in this category, the sections here are all standard except for the location because that depends on where the specimen was collected in your facility. So that will be different, but this information is standard what you will enter in. It's also indicated here what you put in there. Once, and this is the area I was telling you about that asks, has resident been transferred from an acute care facility in the past four weeks? If you select no, these questions will not be there. If you select yes, these questions populate and you would just enter these questions and then you're done with the event. Once you've completed the event, select save. And then once you select save the event, you'll see a, note, a confirmation pop up saying that it was created successfully. The event number, you can write this down if you want, either put it on the event reporting form or some way of tracking in case you want to track a specific event for resident. This is another way you can also search for events. As I mentioned earlier, there's many ways to search for an event on a resident, um, whether resident ID number, name, date of event, or event ID number. However, as I said, you do not have to write this down because of the other options to search for an event. So now we're gonna get into summary data reporting. And this is a form that's optional to use. Um, some facilities have their own way of tracking CDI lab ID events, that's fine. Um, but you can use this if you want to. The middle columns here says do not use this section. Those are regarding UTI. They do not apply to this project, so do not complete this information here. Only for the CDI lab ID events. The main reason, this, the main information that we were looking for are the totals for these sections here. So the total number of residents, or resident days, the total resident emissions, and total resident emissions on C. difficile treatment for a month. And I'll show you in just a minute where you're gonna enter that information. So to get started with enter, completing a, or entering a summary data report, go to summary data, add, and just like the monthly reporting plan, you're gonna select the month and year. Once you have done that, you will go down to MDRO and CDI lab by day event reporting. The other modules that you may see, denominators for long-term care or prevention process measures, you will disregard. Those do not apply to this project. Only the section that says MDRO and CDI lab ID event reporting. Here's where you'll enter in the totals I was just mentioning, which is resident admissions total, total resident days, and total number of admissions on CD difficile treatment. You'll put them here. These other infections you see on the right these are just other infections you will ignore because they do not apply to this project. You're only gonna focus on C. difficile column. The checkbox here that's lab ID event all specimens is defaulted. This came from the monthly reporting plan when you check that other checkbox that verify that you're looking at all specimens. The report no events box will not be checked automatically. However, if you have no events to report for that month, you will check this box. This lets the system know that there are no events to report. If you leave the box blank, the system will, will understand that you have an event to report and it will expect an event to be reported for that month. Once you're done doing, uh, completing this section here, um, you will select save. Once you've selected save, this is kind of what I was just uh, reviewing, just kind of little further instructions. Once you select save, um, you're done with your summary data report. So the last thing I want to go over are alerts. So as I mentioned about the summary data report, for example, if you have an event to report and if you, for, if you selected the checkbox and but you forgot to enter in, you didn't select the checkbox because you have an event to report, but you forgot to enter an event, the system will have an alert saying that there's a missing event. Or if you selected, if you um, selected the checkbox for no events, but let's say you report an event, the system will say, wait, what's going on? It will say that there's an incomplete summary. It will just know that there's something wrong with the connection. So you'll get an alert pop up. And it's usually applying for only the events and the summary data reports. In this case, we're going to look at an example of one, which is the incomplete summaries. What you actually do is click on the number. And once you click on the number, it will take you to the, the page here. And you're going to select under the tab. Because we're looking at incomplete summary data, you're going to go to this tab here. And you will see all the list of incomplete summaries under this list. In this case, there are only two. Click the summary ID number. 
and it will take you back to the page to correct. So in this case, what happened was this box forgot. The user forgot to check this box here for report no events. So the system thought that there was supposed to be an event. Therefore, um, there was an alert for missing event and also an alert for incomplete summary. So when the user goes back and uh, clicks, uh, checks this box here, that will remove the alert for the missing event. It will also fix the alert for the summary data. So that is all there is to reporting. So we just reviewed how to create a monthly reporting plan, how to add an event, and how to create a summary data report. Here's your contacts. There's a primary contact, NHSN contact person. You also have your uh, state lead here is also listed. So if you have any questions about the NHSN system, you're welcome to contact any one of those contacts listed up here. Here's some resources. This is also available in the handout that you can access from the nursing home webpage. And that's all there is to it. Thank you.